without further ado, I'm going to turn to Harry Bartia and just ask uh, him to introduce his uh, hopes for this meeting in the next four days. Harry. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Adrian. It's really nice to be here. Uh, and especially at a time when uh, there are interesting developments all over the world. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Indian context as I come from India. Uh, it's after 30 years that we have had uh, a majority government elected. Uh, they have been in, in government for last eight months. When they started, we, uh, we had high inflation, almost, uh, I would say, low growth rate, uh, high debt burden in the companies. Banks are also a bit under stress. And to be fair, government started with very, I would say, strong action, uh, almost uh, 50 different policy decisions, uh, eight ordinances, so strong action on reform. You, and you will hear from some of the leaders, our finance minister uh, and our power minister and the two chief ministers of the states are here, and, uh, and you will see, and you'll hear about what's what's their agenda but one of the one of the things i just wanted to highlight was in india as you all of you know that our demographics are very young almost 60% of the population is below the age of 35 uh, we we had a strong agricultural economy but if you look at the size of it which is quite small right now but it uh, employs almost 50% or employees or underemployees, 50% of the population, but forming only about 17% of the economy. Now, uh, that, that throws a big challenge because India is trying to industrialize. So we have almost 15 to 17 million people coming into the job market every year. And, uh, and that's a challenge for every government. And uh, what you see is... Uh, uh, strong thrust towards urbanization where people want to move from rural areas to find jobs and of course the, the more younger people coming into the job market. Now the, the challenge that we face is the, for the people who are first time coming into the job market and uh, people who come from very poor families, parents were agricultural laborers and uh, to find jobs for them and to train them ha has been a big, big task. So here I'll, I'll have, I would say I have two messages uh, for, for this year's forum. Firstly, business can play a very important role in creation of livelihoods. And I say this because only 25% of India's pop uh, people who are in the jobs have regular jobs. The rest are mostly self-employed. And uh, if you take the agricultural part out, so, so what we need is, of course, uh, the pillars of strong pillars of education, employability. And by employability, I mean, of course, a, lo a lot of thrust on vocational education, and lastly, innovation and entrepreneurship. So self-employment through entrepreneurship is going to be uh, one of the major ways we, where you can bring in the young into the, into the job market. Now, you know, one of my companies employs almost 35,000 people every year, and uh, they leave after one year, and they come from class 10 or class, uh, class 12. And what we find is they are the first time job seekers, and after a year, they are able to go out to the job market, and they have propensity to find a better job and a higher income. So I think while the education system gears up for vocational training or proper, uh, uh, or in the primary education, find proper ways to train people for the job market, I think business can play a very important role in creation of livelihood. Thirdly, secondly, I would say, uh, is uh, India has 
started this big program for Make in India. You have seen it outside in Davos, uh, which is really to not only for the global market, but for our Indian market, which continues to grow presently at 6 to 7 percent, hopefully will grow at 8 to 9 percent in the next two, two and a half years. So that that is going to absorb a lot of people from the agricultural side and bring, bring it into manufacturing. Lastly, uh, I must conclude and say that uh, for, for me, the best corporate social responsibility would be to really create livelihoods. And I think creating sustainable enterprise will help create sustainable livelihood. Thank you. Harry, thank you very much. Um, Winnie Benjamina, two of the big themes here in Davos uh, in the theme of the new global context is both inequality and climate, and you've got very um, uh, strong views on both of those and strong contributions to make. Can you share with us your thoughts for this year's meeting? <clears throat> thank you, Adrian. Yes, extreme economic inequality is out of control globally, and it's getting worse. At the same time, the impacts of climate change are exacerbating inequality. Last year, Oxfam released a report here at Davos where we said 85 people, richest people, owned as much wealth as the bottom 50%, 3.5 billion people. Well, this year we've released another report, and that figure has come down to 80, 80 people own as much wealth as the bottom 50%. So extreme inequality is increasing very rapidly. And if it isn't checked by next year, 1%, the top 1% will own more than the 99% combined. Is this the kind of world we want to live in? We're concerned because, Oxfam's concerned because this has an impact on poverty. We cannot eradicate poverty with these levels of extreme inequality. So global leaders here in Davos have the power and the influence to make a difference on this. We have here 1,500 business leaders, global business leaders. We're going to have here 40 heads of state and government including the most powerful, like Angela Merkel of Germany, like the Prime Minister of China, like President Jacob Zuma, who is the president of the most unequal country in the world. So we can make a difference here. I'm here to call for urgent action from the world leaders, the business leaders here, to stem the tide of inequality and to start action on climate change. I'm here to ask hard questions. I'm here to really broach difficult subjects. The message is that extreme inequality is not inevitable. It's a result of policy choices. And with the right choices, we can stem that tide. And business leaders have a role to play political leaders have a role to play. So I hope that at this meeting, we will focus on the solutions. Oxfam has put out a package of seven types of solutions, policy solutions. I will not go into them now, perhaps in, at question time. But there are solutions. And we have seen regions, countries, reducing extreme inequality and lifting people out of poverty as they promoted growth. So I look forward to these discussions, robust discussions with business and political leaders here. Thank you very much. Winnie, thank you very much. Catherine Garrett-Cox, in addition to being a CEO of Alliance Trust, you're also a young global leader. Uh, and uh, you know the forum well from, from both sides. You're also based not in the square mile, but in, in Dundee in Scotland. Can you give us some of your perspectives on this year's annual meeting? Thank you, Adrian, and very good morning to everybody. And um, uh, echoing my, my co-chair's um, gratitude, thank you for your time and, and how delighted I am to join everybody today. I mean, I think from a, an overall business perspective, one of the things that we see right now is that the world is facing some very critical choices. So in terms of the big themes that the annual meeting is discussing, we have this interesting um, disconnect between a world that is opening up 
due to the technological advances that we're seeing and increasing transparency and speed of information. And yet we have increasingly worrying trends towards sectarianism, nationalistic approaches, and protectionism in certain areas. And I think you know one of the things that's going to be so critical and one of the key things that I'm looking for in this year's annual meeting is to be able to see very resilient and responsible leadership at this pivotal time. And what, I, what do I mean by that? I think ultimately, at Alliance Trust for 127 years, we have really wanted to put values and our own responsibilities to broader society very much at the heart of what we do. And I think that you know when we had the unfolding of the financial crisis a few years ago, people really lost their way. And I think over the years, whilst some conversations have certainly uh, happened perhaps behind closed doors, I'm delighted to see that this year, the World Economic Forum has put values-based leadership discussions front and center of many sessions. And I think ultimately, um, you know, our very strong view is that this is how we can collectively build a sustainable future. We need to recognize that business is part of society, has broad responsibilities to society, and whether it's in our actions, in our own investment choices, in how we engage with other companies, uh, getting them to recognize that these are important themes and trends, whether addressing income inequality, climate change, and all of these things, I think ultimately this is what I really want to see. And it's very simple, because ultimately if you're a business and you choose to act against society, then in time society will act against you. So this is one of choice, one of resilient leadership, and I'm very excited about the week ahead. So thank you. Catherine, thank you very much. Roberto Setobal is um, a strong Brazilian presence this year in Davos, and um, it's great to have you as co-chair. But there's also lessons to be learned, I think, here from Brazil uh, and its experience. Um, and can you share with us some of the things you'll be uh, putting on your agenda in the next few days? OK, good morning for <coughs> all of you. Thank you for being here. I'll talk more about emerging markets in general. Um, <clears throat> six years after the global financial crisis, a new global environment emerges on the horizon. Moderate but robust growth has resumed in the US, while China has decelerated. Europe is still muddling through on its own problems. Upon this background, banking industry must adapt to the additional constraints imposed on financial institutions by the new regulatory environment. It is still a challenging outlook, and it is important to note that those three forces will negatively impact emerging markets. That accounts for 85% of the world's population. The US economy has recovered from its post-2008 slowdown. It has been able to achieve moderate but robust growth rates and reduce unemployment in a sustainable way. That's good news for the rest of the world, which will benefit from the growing demand for goods and services by the world's largest economy. However, as a consequence of those improvements, the Fed will start, has already started to gradually remove the monetary stimulus and is likely to raise interest rates this year, if not next year. At the, as this process takes place, emerging uh, market currencies are likely to depreciate further, and their domestic interest rates, both short and long end, will raise, dragging down internal demand. For those emerging markets more reliant on foreign funds, uh, drastic current account adjustments may occur. China economy has decelerated and is, it is widely perceived as structural and permanent. In our view, demand growth from China will not support commodity prices as much as it did in the past. The maturation of investments in natural resources sectors adds add further downward pressures on commodity prices. That is particularly evident in the oil market. Uh, which has been over the last past month the worst performer among major commodities. 
but the prices of other key commodities such, such as iron ore and soy beans have <coughs> also plugged. Even though it's still too soon for definitive conclusions, I believe the decline in commodity prices is at least partially permanent. Commodity exporters will thus lose export income in a permanent way. As already underway, currency depreciation will be needed to adjust current account. And in addition to that, the decline in investments in the commodity producing, producing sector is likely to have a negative impact on domestic demand in those countries. On the other hand, <coughs> commodity importers will benefit, especially those uh, running high energy import bills. And cheaper raw material will exert downward pressures on global inflation. Also positive is the fact that many economies built buffers during the good years, uh, stand now ready for a more challenging global environment. The banking industry faces important challenges on the regulatory fields in this new global environment. The impact of the new capital and liquidity re requirements ranged from heterogeneous reduction of profitability affecting some business lines to activities being completely outlawed. Financial intermediation will become more expensive, especially for higher risk segments such as project finance, credit cards, and small companies. Capital allocation for sovereign debt is under discussion. It is, an, uh, it is another initiative that would uh, affect emerging markets. However, we expect banking industry to come out of this process more resilient. It will also be more capitalized and adhere to better quality, uh, better liquidity standards. Finally, I expect the discussions in Davos to address those important issues and its consequences. And I expect that when we go home in a few days, we have a better view of what should be done to strengthen the world economy. Thank you. Roberto, thank you very much. Now, my apologies for getting everyone in slightly late. I'm going to try and see if we can squeeze in 10 minutes of questions from, from folks here. Uh, can you just raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask? And also, if you do have a question, can you share your name and your organization? That would be fantastic. So if I can just peer out into the room past the lights, which are slightly blocking me. Uh, can I get a sense of who has a question for one of our co-chairs uh, or all of them? Lady in the pink, and we'll get a... Hi, my name is Arantza Iñiguez, Spanish Press Agency, EFE. I have two questions. Um, the first one um, is about the impact in the global economy of the slowdown of the China economy. And the second is regarding the um, women quote of participation mm -hmm. in the forum. Uh, I think the World Economic Forum has retired for every year, and I don't know if you have met this target this year. Thank you very much. Sure, well, let's take um, women participation first um, and hear from both uh, Catherine, Winnie, and uh, perhaps Roberto and Harry, if they'd like to contribute as well. Uh, we, our target is for uh, more women to be engaged in every aspect of global leadership permanently. And last year in Davos, you had Prime Minister Abe announcing his goal of 30% of women's inclusion by 2020 in Japan. We have four task forces currently working with governments to try and improve representation of women across the world in all aspects of global leadership. And if any governments are listening, we're welcome to work with any of them to improve that level. But uh, as we point out cons persistently, uh, when we invite leaders of organizations, we invite the, them as leaders. And if the, uh, if the organizations are functioning to promote uh, men into those roles or they're not doing enough to promote women, then that's reflected in some, to some extent in the invitations to Davos. But if you look at this year, uh, in the past, in the meetings we've held, we've had over 20% of women engaged. This year in Davos, we're up ahead of where we were disappointingly last year. And we want to keep moving that in the right direction because uh, it should be 50%, 50%. Uh, There's no two ways about it. 
Um, you can follow, by the way, also our Global Gender Gap Report, which annually benchmarks a whole range of different factors on this. But um, that's kind of me speaking in my capacity as forum spokesman for a less biased and more independent view. I'll turn to our co-chairs, Winnie. Thank you. This is a very important question. Obviously, here at the World Economic Forum, where I'm told there's 17 per partis percent participation of women at this meeting, the World Economic Forum is limited as to how it can achieve a high participation of women and it's at its annual meetings because women are not occupying senior positions of political leadership or of business leadership. We need to do more there before we can get them to be at meetings such as this. But the signs are good. I was in Brisbane re recently for the G20 summit, and there the G20 leaders made a commitment to pursue 30% increase in women's labor force participation over a period of time. The leaders said they are going to go back to their countries to put in place the policies that will bring more women into paid, safe, good jobs. That's very important, and it's when they're there that they can rise to top leadership. Let me give you one statistic. Quebec, Quebec, by putting in place a child care subsidy, has been able to bring 70,000 women into paid employment, and through that increased its revenue base and was able to pay for that program. So there is a win-win there that when you have more women in paid work, you also increase growth and you also build more women's leadership in business and in politics. So there's a lot to gain and the moment is right to promote women's leadership in politics and in business. Uh, and perhaps what I'd add, just more from a young global leader perspective, I've been participating in the last couple of days in their sessions, and I would say it, it, there's probably um, pretty much gender balance within the young global leader community. I sit on the uh, on the fan on the foundation board of young global leaders, and for the last couple of years, as we've been bringing all types of young global leaders through the system, whether they be from the business community, NGOs, um, public uh, you know public office, we've been working really hard to strive for gender balance. So actually, it's all about the pipeline. I mean, it's the same situation as we have in business. And I think that um, there's probably, in business in general, there is still more ways to go. But I think it's really about having, again, a very strong view that this is important. And as I can see the young, co the young community coming through, both at the young global leaders and at the shapers level, I'm very hopeful for the future. I think there's also an issue that uh, I'd highlight here, which is it's an equity issue that doesn't just affect uh, one gender or another. And if you look at, for example, some of the proposals coming through, like male paternity leave, men actually uh, taking paternity leave is a key factor in helping empower women mm -hmm. to actually pursue careers successfully and pursue jobs. And you can see there's, uh, there's people here like Adam Grant from Wharton Business School who've got a whole range of different recommendations on how men can play a part, importantly, in actually delivering on some of the promises that are talked about. Um, and uh, so I think there's a really interesting range of things coming out of, of this meeting if you're able to attend some of those sessions and kind of follow up with some of those uh, folks on real policies that can move this dial, not just headline announcements from leaders, although they're very important, but also practical steps that can be taken to actually make this issue uh, um, fairer. Um, can I just turn to China and as a kind of engine of uh, global growth and concerns that it might be um, slowing down. We're going to hear today from Premier Li. There's a big Chinese delegation here. We've got Jack Ma from uh, from Alibaba, um, and we have uh, uh, the chairman of uh, chief executive of uh, of Huawei. Uh, Roberto, can I just ask you: Is there a concern? You mentioned you talked about commodity prices. Obviously, China's driving a lot of that global commodities market. Uh, do we have to be concerned about the future of the Chinese economy, or is it is it uh, a good thing, uh, the, the kind of rebalancing that's going on right now? Yes, um, I think that China Chinese economy is decelerating. Um, 
uh, and I think this is affecting uh, mainly the commodity prices. So all countries that are more commodity-driven producers or exporters uh, are being affected by that because they have uh, reduced their uh, export income. So they have to play some adjustments uh, in their economies, uh, like this, the evaluating their, their currencies and things like that, which are already taking place. So uh, some of the effects of this deceleration is already uh, uh, in uh, today's uh, economy, and some of that will take place down the road. I think that the good news is that the US economy is improving, and this might help China, uh, China economy uh, increase exports to, to the US, which will contribute to their GDP growth in the future. Catherine, do you want to? I mean, I think the only thing I would really add is that it, it, people are getting very excited about the fact that China's slowing down, but it's still going to grow at a fair clip. I think that, you know, the big adjustment that China's going to have to make is having um, uh, really had economic driven predominantly by infrastructure growth, um, that they now are making the transition more towards a consumer focused economy. Um, you know, arguably, that is going to be much more. Um, uh, structural rather than cyclical. So I think over time there will be huge benefits, but certainly as Roberto says, in the very short term, it's causing extreme volatility in commodities. But I think it's very easy to forget that if you're growing your economy six, seven percent, I think most economies would be pretty happy with that. <laughs> and Winnie, obviously the Chi Chinese economy has done a great deal to bring people out of poverty in the last 25 years, the reforms that they've put in place. Is, that, is China's future development something you're paying close attention to? Absolutely. Even in terms of achieving the Millennium Development Goals, the f that, that goal number one on eradicating extreme poverty was achieved largely because of China's contribution and India to lift millions out of poverty. But also we have to understand that the commodities markets that the, ex the export of commodities by the developing countries is also one of the drivers of rising inequality. Because you have a situation where in many developing countries that depend on natural resource extraction, that this resource is captured by a small political and economic elite, leaving many, many people without jobs, without incomes, and the resources not plowed back into the lives of people. So China's slowing growth and its impact on the developing countries where it imports from might be an opportunity for these countries to look closely at how the natural resource that's extracted is taxed the fair taxation of that wealth, and the plowing back of those resources into health, into education, and into sectors that create employment for young people. These questions are very political. They need to be debated. And I think this is also the, the slowing of Chinese growth is an opportunity for more discussion of how the natural resources can benefit poor people. Harry, what's your, what are you hoping to hear from Premier Li today and from China's participants at uh, this year's annual meeting? Yeah, firstly, I, I fully agree with Catherine that China is a, is a huge economy and still growing at 7%. So it's really, uh, there is a slowdown. And, uh, and if India goes from 5 to, let's say, 7, 7.5% in the next two years, uh, I think we will see some stability there. And uh, what... What I am hoping to hear from Premier today is really what is the adjustment that China is going through? And I think it's a strategic and a planned adjustment which relates to maybe some of the, uh, the excess investment that have been made in the past few years. And uh, they are very good at it. They will uh, quickly adjust and hopefully stabilize the economy at a, at a reasonable growth rate. U.S. is continuing to grow probably add to that. And I think the, the impact is also by Japan and Europe ha having uh, very uh, 
almost uh, no no growth uh, and deflation so so that is also having an impact on on commodity prices so but i'm i'm hoping that in in a year's time we will see some stability thank you we've always made up the time that um, i deprived you of at the beginning can i just uh, we might have time for one very very quick sort of one line headline answer from our panelists if anyone has an outstanding question or if you want a chance to uh, follow up with them independently afterwards they will be uh, uh, active in the Congress Center. Any hands shooting up that I've missed? If they're not, I'm going to release our co-chairs back into the wild and uh, in wish all of you a very successful and enjoyable and productive annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.